Welcome to our Garden Court webinar. This is the second series of uh, webinars on Black Lives Matter. Uh, such was the interest in the first series. It was unparalleled attendance, and we felt that a second series was a must. So credit to Kim Monteith. He organised the first series and has been the driving force in organising this second one. Uh, such was the interest um, brought about really by the, the death, the tragic death of uh, George Floyd, as we know that brought sharply into focus the issue of racism. And the reality is that it has been ever present. The fact that we're talking about it more now doesn't mean that it wasn't ever in existence. The reality it was ever present and has been present certainly for all of my career. In September 2017, as we know, David Lammy published his review on the criminal justice system and found that discrimination was endemic in our criminal justice system. It was an evidence-based analysis. And I asked a rhetorical question, what really has changed since then? And so our SEP webinar, webinar tonight is um, entitled How to Understand and Confront Racism in Our Criminal Justice System. We have three excellent speakers. Uh, I'm chairing it. I'm Judy Khan. I'm a member of the Garden Court crime team. We have three speakers, all members of the Garden Court crime team, who many of you will know. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dexter Dias, who's going to prov provide an overview. Uh, we'll then hear from Keir Monteith and Danielle Manson, who are going to provide us with some examples. Uh, can I ask that you use the question and answer function if you want to ask a question? It's in the bottom of your screen next to the raised hand. And we're going to keep the chat for feedback and any comments that you might want to make. But if you want to ask a question, I'll, I'll try to monitor those as we go along and we'll deal with those probably at the end of the webinar. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to ask that we hear, first of all, from Dexter. Yes, uh, thank you, Judy. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I want to particularly thank Kia, um, whose vision for all of this was but also Amy for all her hard work. And without that hard work, none of this would happen. I'm conscious I'm on a very limited time, a bit like being in front of the US Supreme Court, just without the rude interruptions, or maybe there will be, we'll see. But let me dive in straight away. And what I thought is rather than do a formal PowerPoint presentation, I thought what might be more interesting for you is if I threw out some thoughts, what uh, Michel Foucault calls provocations. Some of them are pretty fluid and certainly my thinking has changed over the last few months and particularly since the death of George Floyd. But I'd like to put them out there and maybe at the end have a discussion with you. I'd like to touch upon three critical thinkers to try to equip us with some tools for decoding um, how race operates in the criminal justice system. They all happen to be French. And I want to use them to criti uh, critically evaluate three things. The first is the concept of race itself. Secondly, racialized thinking, what is it? And thirdly, institutional or structural racism within the criminal justice system. And before I do that, let me pose a critical question. And it is whether racism is actually even real. Are we, as some commentators suggest, living in a post-racial age? And one of the pushbacks that there has been against Black Lives Matter is this no, very notion, this counter narrative, that racism actually is not real, it's mainly imagined, or it is grossly exaggerated. And to get a flavor of that uh, idea, we'll play the first video, Amy, please. And what you should know is that what is written uh, on the roadway uh, are the letters B, L, M. I'm sick of this narrative, that's what's wrong. The narrative of yeah, the narrative of police brutality. It's a lie. Where's it break? 
lie. This is racism. This is racism is what it is. That's what it is. There is no oppression. There is no racism. It's a leftist lie. It's a lie from the media, the liberal left. Now, residents from Martina has got thank a... You. Yes, thank you, Amy. So racism is actually uh, a leftist lie, and it's an invention of the liberal media. But you might be thinking, well, you know what, Dexter, that's the United States of America. We're not like that in the United Kingdom, are we? And on the other hand, however, in the aftermath of uh, Mr. Floyd's death and the uh, Black Lives Matter protests in the UK, we had in London, where I'm talking to you from, in the central squares, so-called statue defenders openly making Nazi salutes and chanting, I'm racist and I'm proud. The government's response to uh, the death of George Floyd was to announce a cross-governmental inquiry into racial inequality. The head of that inquiry uh, regarded institutional racism as, and I quote, maybe more of a perception than a reality. Johnson himself, our esteemed prime minister, said that people of colour had to, and his words were, get over the sense of victimisation and discrimination. Think about that from number 10 Downing Street. Think about the gaslighting and the sense of how victims of racism are pathologized. But here, it seems to me, is one of the great contests. Here is the battlefield. Shortly after George Floyd's death, Ted asked me to do a talk about racism, which I did. But as soon as uh, Ted Central in New York and in Vancouver launched the talk on their channel, I received what can only be described as a barrage of racism. <clears throat> and some of it was something like this. And Amy, if you'd uh, put up the first photograph, please. So this, this, was, this was in Manchester, and a couple of days after that was put on the side of a shelter, a bus shelter or a tram shelter, this is what happened. The second photograph, Amy, please. So what we've got, it seems to me, um, is something, as Judy mentioned, that is real and surreal part of our lives in the UK. And it's something that these chambers have been fighting for ever since their inception. That was, of course, the reason that I joined Garden Court. I was asked to defend or represent uh, a black family from Birmingham. They came to my chamber. This, uh, there was an inquest about uh, their relative, their son and their brother, who had died in a prison in the West Country. There wasn't uh, legal aid to represent them in those days, but they were in agony because uh, their son, Alton, had injuries all over his body. He had bruising to his legs and his back. He had blood um, in his nose, his eyes and his ears. <clears throat> but the prison officer said, we don't know anything about it. No one could explain how all of that had happened. After a bitter three month inquest, what emerged was that Alton was dragged out of his cell by seven prison officers, two of them on each of his legs, one on each of his arms, and they held him in this horizontal crucifix position. And the seventh officer, who was the most senior of the officers, held Alton's neck between, in a vice-like grip between his four arms and Alton asphyxiated to death. The comments, I spoke about the death of Alton in my TED talk, and the comments I got from white separatists and from alt-right groups were things like it was good that another black criminal was dead. They were good that my client they were happy that my client, Alton's mother, was dead because that was one less black uh, person scrounging, as they put it, on benefits. 
And the question really for us is, was the case of Walter Manning an outlier? Since I've been a human rights lawyer at Garden Court, I've been involved in a number of death in custody cases. I've been in part of social justice campaigns uh, in respect of a number of others. And many of my colleagues at Garden Court have been involved in yet more of these cases. And what they present cumulatively is an alternative social history. We have Cynthia Jarrett, a mother, who died in highly contentious circumstances in her home when the police searched it. And Cynthia's death uh, led to the Broadwater Farm riots, and Cynthia was black. Roger Sylvester was a black man in his 30s who died of brain damage and a heart attack when six, uh, sorry, six police officers restrained him forcibly on the ground, and Roger was black. Joy Gardner was a mature student who died of asphyxia when officers from the Alien Deportation Group, and think about the messaging there, the Alien Deportation Group restrained her and wrapped 13 feet of tape around her head, and Joy was black. Christopher Alder was a 28-year-old man, a former British paratrooper who was taken to a police station injured and police officers stood around watching him for 10 minutes as he died. And Christopher was black. Zaid Mubarak was a youth who was put into a prison cell with a known psychopathic racist who got up in the middle of the night and broke off the table leg and clubbed Zaid to death and then drew a swastika on the wall of the cell with the rubber of his shoe. And Zaid was Asian. Gareth Myatt was a child of 15 who was restrained by three prison officers while he was holding a piece of paper with his mother's telephone number on it. As the officers were restraining him, Gareth was saying, like George Floyd, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And Gareth died of asphyxia and Gareth was biracial. Sean Rigg, was a musician who died whilst being restrained by police for eight minutes in a restraint position we've known all the way back to Alton's Manning case to be highly dangerous and potentially lethal. And Sean was black. Olashaney Lewis was an IT graduate who died of asphyxia while being restrained by 11 police officers. And Olashaney was black. And Cherry Gross was a mother who was shot in the back by a police officer in her home in front of her children, and Cherry was black. How should we understand all of this? I want to look at those three topics very briefly. So firstly, the question of race. If this was a social science conference, I wouldn't need persuading, uh, to persuade you that race is a social construct. But what does that actually mean? How has it been constructed? As lawyers, of course, we like evidence. And so what is actually the evidence about this? In scientific terms, if you look at our DNA, we are a relatively new species. Homo sapiens is only about 200,000 years old. And if you compare us, for example, to ants, which are 120 million years old, we are 600 times younger than they are. And we come from a very small originating group, a very small sample size. I wonder how many people are aware of the Toba incident in Indonesia. If you didn't, well, you almost did not exist because 74,000 years ago in Indonesia, at Toba, there was a super eruption that created a volcanic winter that lasted between five to 10 years. And it almost wiped out our species. And those who survived were principally in Africa. About 10,000 years after that event, with their populations really diminished, parts of that group started to migrate out of Africa to the rest of Eurasia and eventually uh, into Europe about 40 to 50,000 years ago. So in evolutionary terms, that is a blink of an eye. 
And therefore, it is no surprise that we share so much DNA with each other. In fact, we share 99.9%. And what does that mean? It means that a Nordic blonde person may share more DNA with me than that Nordic person may share with somebody from Wales. And I choose Wales just randomly. The reason for this is that we are a new species. We share more than we have ever differs. When the Human Genome Project reported just after the turn of the millennium, one of the first things that the scientists who had decoded the entire DNA code of the, of the human uh, species, one of the first things they said was this, that race as a scientific and biological concept just does not exist. It is not a valid scientific term. But then if it doesn't exist, why is it so important? It became salient about 400, 500 years ago. And so if you spoke to a Roman, for example, they would find it really difficult to understand that um, someone who had black skin would be regarded by many, many people as in some way inferior or different. They, there was a Roman emperor, Caracalla, in uh, 211 Common Era, who was not white. He was Libyan, Syrian, or Berber. But that really wasn't an issue. And this modern concept of race really began with two things. It began with the Atlantic slave trade, and it began with colonialism. And the need there was to justify uh, the enslaving of people, the taking of their lands, taking of their women and children as resources, and in many cases, the genocidal eradication of uh, whole uh, population groups. And they still needed the uh, European adventurers and colonizers to do it in the name of God and to justify it um, morally. And how do you do that? You do that, you square that circle by saying that the people who are exploiting or killing, in fact, are not human in the same way as us. So Foucault, going back to Foucault again, a French philosopher, critical thinker, he subverts the idea of Francis Bacon. As some of you will know, Francis Bacon was the first QC, the first Queen's Council. And the Baconian idea is that knowledge is power. <clears throat> Foucault says, actually, it's more interesting and nuanced than that. He asks us to think about how power is knowledge, how it constructs it, how power, if you have a monopoly or control of significant amounts of power, how that assembles what counts as legitimate knowledge and truth. We need to see race in that light. It is not a fact of biology. It is not a scientific fact. It is the production of social power. It's what Foucault calls a game of truth. And, it's n and race, therefore, doesn't actually exist. But dominant power says it exists. And many, many people will still believe it. M maybe, maybe many of you do. And if you do, that's not your fault, but it is the operation of a dominant ideology. And of course, this has massive implications for sets of human constructed rules, like the law, which we will come to in a minute. My research that I did when I took a sabbatical uh, in the States at Harvard suggested that what we should do to understand race is to think of it not as this scientific and uh, biological category, but in fact, as a technology. <clears throat> and what it is, is a technology of dehumanization. It's a disqualification from equal species status, a disqualification from equal access to social goods and benefits, equal protection uh, from the law, and also, as we have seen from that appalling list of cases, it is sometimes a disqualification from life itself. 
I want to move on to my second point, racialized thinking. Because where does race get so much of its force, this invention, this great deceit? Why is it one of the most powerful forces in the world? And this is where our second thinker, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, a French sociologist, can help. And Bourdieu asks us to think about the way in which we internalize racialist, uh, sorry, racialized narratives. And if you doubt that, or if you want to see in front of your eyes exactly how that operates, here is a shocking way. And I'm going to ask Amy to play the second video. Amy. In Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best? Uh, Amy, could we play it from the beginning? Amy, please. We go back, Amy. Well, let's just see it from the beginning. Okay. In you. Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with? This one. I like that one. I'm killing. This one. That one? This one. I like to play with this. And can you show me the doll that is the nice doll? And why is that the nice doll? She's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give, and why does that look bad? Because it's black. Hmm. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Fifteen out of the twenty-one children preferred the white doll. Yes, thank you, Amy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen that video over a hundred times and I keep hoping for a different outcome. Um, and I do find it uh, deeply affecting every time I see it. But that gives us um, just an indication of the strength of racialized thinking and the way in which it infiltrates and permeates everything. And when we're in a court, when we've got judges, when we've got prosecutors, when we've got members of the jury, we need to think about that force. And it's not necessarily because they're conscious, uh, overt, signed up, MAGA hat wearing racists. It's because it's much more complex and pernicious than that. Very briefly, let me turn to the third point, um, institutional and structural racism. How do we know that racism actually exists institutionally within the criminal justice system? What um, Pierre Bourdieu calls one of his social fields. So if we look at the metrics, the statistics, the facts speak for themselves. Black women um, are twice as likely to be sent to prison or similar drugs offenses as white women. Black children are six times more likely to be imprisoned. Black people generally are seven times more likely to have the 50,000 volts of a taser fired into their body. And black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched. But of course, stop and search is just the beginning of a process. And at each stage, there is a marked racial disproportion in terms of who is arrested 
who is charged, what they're charged with, who is prosecuted, who is sentenced to imprison and uh, to prison, and who, importantly, thinking about the back end of the system, who is breached and reported. Disproportions at all those points. Be careful about looking for individual racists. This quest for culprits is what our third uh, French thinker, sociologist, Loic Vacant, who is professor at Berkeley in California, and he calls it the logic of the trial, the search for individual culprits. And he says the danger of that preoccupation is that it obscures and distracts us from the identification of the mechanism that produces and reproduces these outcomes, which really has been the basis of my research here and in the United States. And it's a process which produces racialized um, and disproportionately bad outcomes for people of color. Don't obsess about the individual. Although, of course, one of the interesting things about the work we do is we deal with it on a case by case basis. And that is one of the reasons I do research because I want to try to step back and try to get an overview and an insight into what these driving mechanisms are. Don't let the system off the hook. The effects of racism, um, are they real? Are they just something in the heads of people of color as Boris Johnson and his appointed um, head of the inquiry seem to think? After my TED talk, I was contacted by hundreds of people from all over the world. But one of them was a black woman who was incredibly competent and uh, confident as a professional who seemed on the surface and externally to cope. But she always wore long sleeves. And the reason she did that was that um, her arm was covered in rashes. And those rashes would flare up when yet again, in her job, a very important job, she suffered racism that she, and which she suffered on a regular basis. Clinical psychologists have a simple phrase for this. And their phrase is, the body keeps score. And so you can try to proceed and deal with it. But at some point, the effects of this kind of social trauma are going to have their effect because the body will register all of them and it will keep a score. And of course, the, the question is, is it just a physical manifestation like with that um, professional woman? The other part, when I was at Harvard, uh, I was attached also to the Department of Psychology very deliberately because I wanted to try to think about how racism is in fact a form of social pain. And that's how I think we should think of it, as a form of social trauma. Our neural systems, one of the most sophisticated things in the entire universe, um, what they have done, they're very effective, parsimonious. And what they have done is the neural systems for social pain have piggybacked on much older structures that register physical pain. So we're taught and we're brought up with the idea, aren't we, that sticks and stones may break our bones and everybody knows what the rest of that saying is. <clears throat> but it's wrong because words do hurt us. And when you're in the lab and if you look at a functional MRI scanner, you can actually see the register of racism, how it works and how it operates and affects the brain. And why does it hurt? What is actually happening? And it seems to me that this is because of the fundamental human dilemma we all face. We've evolved from the savannas of Africa, let us not forget. We've evolved as deeply uh, social animals. We had to do that to survive. But we police those complicated social groups by using ostracism, by making rules about who belongs and who doesn't, who is a member, who is an equal member, and who is not. And that is where race does its work. 
I want to end by saying this. And all of this has been, I guess, a long run up to the wicket, if you excuse the metaphor from an imperial game I love, but I am and always will be a child of the empire. I turn to the question of how we deracialize our society and important institutions like the criminal justice system. I've been, I've been asked to advise an eminent university about how they can go about decolonizing their curriculum. And what I've said to them is, look, the first step is that we have to decolonize not just the curriculum, but the first step is to decolonize our head, our brain, our mind. And that is the first point. That's the first thing we have to do before we argue about whether Chaucer or Conrad falls within the perimeters of legitimate and acceptable knowledge. So first do that. And how do you do that? You do that, it seems to me, by understanding two things. The first is to understand what race is. And I hope, if nothing else, that my presentation tonight, the thoughts that I've thrown out to you, may, uh, may help you to think about that in a different way if you hadn't already thought about race in those terms. And the second is to understand the deep paradox at the heart of race. <clears throat> and that is this perfect inversion, this great sleight of hand that race, this trick race has pulled off because there are two competing narratives. The first is the racialized version. And that is what Boris Johnson subscribes to, that uh, race as a concept is real, but racism is largely imaginary. The second narrative, the counter narrative, which I would argue is the truth, is the, exactly the opposite, that race actually is a fiction and racism is very, very, real. How is it possible to deracialize the criminal justice system? How could we do that? The thing is, in court, I have seen in case after case over the 30 years I have been practicing exactly that process happening. And you see jurors who had this racialized Daily Mail Brexiteer narrative stripped away. And what happens is that over, the, and this is part of our job, and what happens is that over the course of the case, the person in the dock or the person who has been killed in an inquest becomes a human being. And that is what happened in the case of Alton. In that case, right at the end, the all white jury, all 11 of them, changed completely how they looked at the case. At the first, in the first instance, as you, those of you who practice in inquest will know, uh, jurors themselves have uh, a round of questioning for themselves. And the first types of questions were about, can you tell us more about this black man's criminal history and his background? By the end of the case, when prison officer number 18 or 21 came into the witness box, they would put up a hand and say, Mr. Diaz, would you mind if we ask question first? And by that point, I, I trusted them. And I said, I didn't. <clears throat> they would say to the officer, how could you do that to that lad? How could you do that? And so they had changed. And from becoming a black criminal in prison, he became a human being. When the jury came into court to announce their verdict, and it was a historic verdict, the first unlawful killing verdict against a private prison in the United Kingdom, there was just this white noise in court as the jury announced that. And Alton's sister, who was sitting next to me, went into the aisle uh, to my left and then just started pointing at the prison officers and shouting at them, you killed my brother, you killed my brother. And I turned to Alton's mother, who was sitting next to me, and I said, um, Mrs. Manning, I'm very sorry for your family. And she said to me, Mr. Diaz, you are family. And she pointed at the prison officers and she said, and they are family. And she pointed at the jury and she said, and they are family. Their families bicker and fight and somehow we have 
to sort it out. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why I'm grateful to all of you for coming. I'm grateful to Keir and Amy for putting it on for, and to Judy for hosting and Danielle for joining uh, me on the panel with the others. And that is why I believe passionately that events like this are so important because we've got to sort it out and we have to find new solutions to do that. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Dexter. I, I mean, I, I have a couple of questions for you. I might wait until the end. Um, I think sure, uh, your examples of inquests that you've been involved in are both depressing and um, very interesting to, to hear the outcome, in particular in Alton's case. And um, in Mubarak's case, the, the startling thing was he was, in fact, incarcerated he was placed in a cell with a known white supremacist if i'm not mistaken right psychopathic a known psychopathic racist judy who had sent letters that the prison service had intercepted which said i want to nail bomb bradford and southall and i want to kill excuse the word n words and packies yeah they had those letters and they they put him in a cell with him uh, and, and you've dealt with a number of high profile inquests involving yeah. young uh, men who've tragically lost their lives, young men of, of colour. And I just wonder whether you think that any steps have been taken or any if there's been any progress in terms of preventing further deaths in the future. Or do you think it's still a fairly bleak picture of what's happening in prisons? Uh, Judy, the last month and a half or so since the turn of the year, I've been leading counsel in an inquest, death in, a death in police custody of someone called Leon Briggs. Um, it's been in the media a lot. Because the jury is about to go out, I can't comment on that, okay? So I'm not gonna say anything about Leon's case, but I would ask everybody, the jury will go out next week, I ask everybody to watch very carefully. He's a person of colour with mental health problems who died after contact with the police. I ask everybody to watch very carefully what happened in Leon's case. When that's done, I'm going to answer your question. All right. right well, we'll, all, we'll all watch out for that one. Uh, and I ask those questions in particular because I know that Deb Coles, who's the executive director of Inquest, is, is joining us. Is, is oh, the participants. So, yeah. And I'm going to ask you to deal with just one of the, there's a fairly lengthy question from Matthias Zuck. So I'm going to ask that you read that one while we're hearing from Keir. Maybe I'll come back to you on that later. But there's right. all that from Hannah Sinclair, which is how can we progressively use the Equality Act when it seems to consider race as a biological category uh, and we need to change this way of... Yeah, brilliant. Who was that from? Hannah Sinclair. Anna, that's a... Anna. Genius, and uh, Hannah or Anna? Anna. 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 That's a genius question. I'll I'll come back on that. And where was the other question, Jude? What was the other one? Look at the bottom of the screen. There's a Q and A. Yeah. On the right, and you'll see that there are some questions in yeah. there. Third question now as well, I think. But I'm going to ask that you have a look at the second question in particular, which is looking at the position of, um, in particular. Uh, people from Roma communities and uh, other perhaps Eastern European communities and, and the prejudice that they're experiencing. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to read that because there, there are yeah. some statistics given there as well. So sure, sure, sure. later on. I'm going to turn, if we may now, to Keir, who's going to give us some examples, I, I believe now. Over to you, Keir. Thank you very much, um, Judy. Thank you very much, Dexter. Um, I hope the big topics that have been raised in the last 30 minutes by Dexter, the reality of racism, the lack of difference between us, issues of power, issues of knowledge, maybe truth to power, racialized thinking, structural racism, institutionalized racism, and trauma, ongoing trauma. And what can be done in relation to all of that? I hope in the next 15 minutes, what I have to say will provoke further discussion and action. And maybe most importantly, 
action. Action inside the courtroom and action outside the courtroom. And so it starts thus. It's hard to believe he is no longer with us. He has missed so much. There's not one day that goes by where I don't think of him. It upsets me that I can't talk to him when I just want to talk to him so much. Carlington will never be forgotten. He will always have my heart. The words of Laura Berkey, Carlington's former wife and life partner. Shemika Spencer, Carlington's sister, said the following on behalf of the family. We, the family of Carlington Spencer, who we call Jammy, want to thank the jury for their conclusions. It was evident that they were 100% engaged as they overlooked nothing. From their answers to the questions left to them by the coroner, one would think that they were a group of accredited medical professionals rather than random me members of society from varying backgrounds. We could see that their hearts and soul were involved. It goes to show the big difference when people care and are of pure heart as the jury's attitude towards Jammy and their reasoning far surpassed that of the actual medical professionals at Morton Hall Detention Centre. Special thanks to Carlington's friends, fellow detainees who showed how much they cared and valued him by showing up at the hearing to be his voice from the grave. Things would have been so difficult if not for them. Our lives will never be the same again because in spite of this success, Carlington is still not here. Nevertheless, we find some peace in knowing his death was not in vain. Sean Horstead, a member of Garden Court Chambers and a fantastic inquest lawyer, was going to speak about Carlington Spencer. The inquest into his death and the topic of racism in the justice system. His address to you would have been powerful, eloquent and personal. But sadly, he cannot be with us this evening. It's important to note in the context of what we're talking about that he's a white bloke, an ally and a fervent anti-racist. He lived and breathed this case along with those at inquest and wanted the facts to tell their own story in terms of the racism in the justice system. I'm going to tell you as best I can what happened in 2017 when Carlington died during his detention at Morton Hall Immigration Centre? What happened at the inquest two years later and why? Those events are being talked about again in 2021. This is a distressing story with no happy end. Carlington, at the point of his untimely death, was just 38. He'd grown up in Jamaica and was a skilled worker. He'd run his own metal fabrication business, fitting doors and windows. And that's where he met Laura. They started a relationship and in 2008 were married. After moving to Derby with Laura in 2010, Carlington suffered a series of difficult bereavements, developed a troubled relationship with alcohol 
And after separating from Laura, he became homeless for periods, struggled with mental and physical ill health, and in April 2016, was imprisoned for offences including criminal damage, breach of bail and possession of crack cocaine. He was sentenced to just over two years. In May 2017, towards the end of his sentence, Carlington was transferred to Morton Hall IRC, Immigration Removal Centre. He was to be deported. If he'd been born in Britain, he would have been free. But since the 1970s, if you're not a British citizen and receive a sentence of 12 months plus, then you become liable to being deported. And you get locked up before that happens. He was visited in the detention centre by friends and family. There were positive plans for the rest of his life. Maybe a pizza restaurant in Jamaica. And Laura said, we believed we would be together forever after overcoming so much together. However, on Thursday the 28th of September 2017, Laura received a call from a detainee. He said Carlington had had a stroke. She called Morton Hall, but to no avail. Despite being a regular visitor, the computer said no. And no further details were provided by them to her. About a week later, she was told that Carlington was in hospital. And on Sunday, the 1st of October 2017, she got a call from the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. He'd been operated on and was stable. But when Laura arrived at the hospital a few days later, Carlington was dead. Before the inquest started, before the inquest started, the lawyers had to launch a legal battle in the High Court to prevent the Home Office deporting a key witness. The lawyers for Carlington's family were successful, but the need for this important intervention says a lot about the Home Office and its attitude to justice and due process. The inquest did not have any CCTV evidence because the police failed to seize it and others failed to preserve it. The police did not take any statements from any of the detainees who actually witnessed what happened. Assumptions were made by officials that Carlington was on drugs when in fact he was suffering from a stroke. The jury heard that on the 28th of September 2017, Carlington had become increasingly unwell. Fellow detainees told the inquest that he was slurring his words. He was, quotes, fire hot, end quotes. The left side of his face was drooping and he was dribbling. He was found collapsed on the floor twice and complained of headache and pain in his eyes. They alerted healthcare staff about their concerns. The inquest heard that the healthcare staff did not think to assess for stroke related symptoms, despite Carlington's pre existing conditions. Morton Hall staff and nurses told the inquest that they believed Carlington was suffering from a physical attack related to spice. They opened an illicit substances log and placed Carlington under regular observation. That log was closed by healthcare staff after verbal discussion with an officer at 8.45 p.m. without reviewing Carlington's well-being. No welfare checks were carried out overnight. The jury found 
that there was no evidence to prove that Carlington had taken spice on the 28th or the 29th of September. The jury found that the interpretation by the healthcare staff of his presenting condition was not reasonable. And on multiple occasions, healthcare staff failed to assess the situation correctly, resulting in confirmatory bias. The next morning on the 29th of September, detainees noticed that Carlington's health had not improved. He was still unable to move his left arm. The left side of his face was drooping. He was dribbling and complaining of a headache. They set off the emergency alarm bells in the detention centre and banged on the windows until staff arrived. Just after one, staff at the detention centre called a, quote, non-emergency, end quote, ambulance, which arrived at 2.15. The inquest heard that it took some time to get through security at Morton Hall, and they eventually arrived with Carlington at 2.25. The jury found there was a failure to follow correct emergency procedures, causing unnecessary delays in arranging an ambulance. Carlington arrived at Lincoln County Hospital at 3.32 and died three days later at Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham on the 3rd of October 2017. The inquest jury found that he died as a consequence of a stroke and identified series of failings which possibly contributed to his death, including inadequate, inadequate management of his type 1 diabetes, numerous missed opportunities by disciplined staff to sufficiently monitor, and failure of medical staff to identify symptoms of stroke and take appropriate actions in a timely manner. The senior coroner informed the family in front of the jury that he was preparing a report to prevent future deaths and to send it to Morton Hall and Nottingham NHS and other bodies in which he would identify the practical steps to take when responding to emergency calls to detainees to prevent confirmatory bias interfering with a proper analysis of the detainee's symptoms. And the coroner was true to his word. He wrote to the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, in August 2020, underlining the point that the authorities need to be aware of who are they who they are deporting or not. He noted that in this particular case, two witnesses gave important and I quote, critical evidence during the inquest. I've not been provided with a response from the Home Secretary. He wrote to the Legal Aid Agency, noting it was a matter of profound concern that access to representation in this complex and challenging inquest had been stated to be uncertain and difficult. I've not been provided with a response from the Legal Aid Agency. He wrote to the police making five points, including that the case gave rise to a form of confirmation bias. The police did provide a response to a number of the points. But in relation to confirmation bias, the police said on the 24th of November 2020, the following, quote, the police investigation is ongoing and the current investigators have had sight of this view to ensure that an appropriate investigative mindset is applied. I don't understand what that means. He wrote to the detention centre and they provided an action plan with a promise that all staff would undertake unconscious bias training. The NHS Trust provided a 36-page response that detailed new measures and procedures 
that they had adopted. But despite the letters and the responses, the case has a very sad end. The state's institutions, plural, saw a black man, assumed he was on drugs, and didn't see he was having a stroke. From what I've read, his life could have been saved. He was just 38. It's being called confirmation bias, but that is racism by another name. Within the chronology of events, as the family observed, there is evidence of humanity and justice. It was one of the detainees who understood the importance of getting evidence of what had happened written down as soon as possible. He knew that they couldn't depend on the state to independently investigate and obtain evidence. Couldn't even rely on anyone, anyone, to preserve CCTV. He had to organize and take control. And that's what's happening on the streets. It's the mobile phone that records what's happening. Inside closed institutions, that's not possible. But old school pen and paper ensures vital evidence is preserved. I understand his name is Joseph and it was Joseph that managed to pass on that old school evidence to a charity who in turn passed it on to committed solicitors and counsel. Collective action of those detained at the time. They knew something was wrong and they tried their very best to summon and ask for help. And when the worst happened and Carlington lost his life, they stood up for justice and they told the jury the truth of what occurred. Before he attended the inquest, Sean had his own preconceptions about that jury in Norfolk. I guess in a perfect world, you wouldn't, but he did. I can only speak for myself, but don't we all make assumptions about others? I do. Every single day, I continually anticipate what others will think and how they'll respond. I make assumptions about their views and how they see life. But Sean was blown away as was the family, by how the jury stepped up to the mark and were 100% committed to their job. They saw the injustice of what had happened and responded with humanity, eloquence, and spoke truth to power. But it didn't stop there. So appalled by what he had seen and heard, the coroner sent letters out to the relevant parts of the state's institutions, as you've heard. We will have to see if the verdict and the letters achieve any long-term change. Justice for Carlington and the many others that die at the hands of the state has to be obtained before their death. And that's a bigger ask. That requires equality within society. The issues that Dexter's taught about in terms of power. It takes a lot for people to give up their power. And so far, that's never occurred as a result of verdicts or letters. As his sister said, our lives will never be the same again. Because in spite of this success, Carlington is still not here. Keir, thank you very much. That was um, very moving, actually.
and um, ask you one or two questions. But I think, given the time, that what we'll do is we'll move on to Danielle. And uh, there are some questions in our Q&A bar at the bottom. If anyone wants to um, ask any questions, do put them in there and we'll see how we get on and whether we can answer some of those at the end. So without any further ado, we'll move on to Danielle, who's going to give us a, an example. So thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Judy. Um, so I'm relatively junior compared to other members of the panel. And I suppose what I have to say is um, informed by my experience, um, predominantly in the magistrates court, actually. So most of my examples are either magistrates court cases or youth court cases. Um, but before I go on and talk about examples, I suppose what I wanted to do, first of all, is to maybe address a, an elephant in the room um, a, a, about me personally and obviously that's the issue of colorism and I know that there's been um, a lot of talk about that um, quite recently and post BLM and everything that I say I obviously sit um, in a, a position of privilege to a certain extent because um, although I'm, I'm, I'm mixed race my dad's from Jamaica I, I'm, I'm light-skinned and I recognize that actually my experiences as a practitioner and um, you know the experiences of, of some of my family members are going to be different to to, to those people who who are darker skinned than me. And the reality is, is when we look at overrepresentation within the criminal justice system, it's often black men actually that are overrepresented. And I I could never walk in their shoes or share their experiences. And I haven't been stopped and searched by the police. Um, and and I, I haven't been mistaken. Um, as the defendant when I've been at court. Um, so what I say is, is, is obviously framed in, in, in those terms, um, but I will say a little bit as something about being mistaken for the defendant at court, because I do think that um, there's a flip side to, to, to that argument. But when, um, when Keir asked me to speak on this panel, and thank you Keir for asking me, um, I, I started thinking about um, racism in the, in the criminal justice system. And actually I started to think back to, um, when Chris Rock hosted the um, Oscars in 2016, and he was talking about um, Hollywood racism. And he was basically saying, you know, in Hollywood, it's not fetch me a lemonade racism, it's sorority racism. So it's, you know, we like you Rhonda, but you're just not Kappa or whatever. And I think actually, even though in the criminal justice system, it, it is different, it's, it's that subtleness of, of racism that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not, you're not going to get police officers on body-worn footage calling, you know, a defendant the N-word or, or the P-word, you know, and you're not going to get a judge making um, overtly racist comments when they're sentencing. It, it, it's something really, really subtle and it's really difficult to put your finger on it. And so when we look forward about how we can combat racism within the criminal justice system well I think you have to first take a step back and actually realize that you know what we're dealing with it's it's a manifestation of what people look at uh, as traditional racism and you know it, it's not lynchings etc but equally it has in a, a just as a tragic and, and detrimental uh, effect on people's lives um so really experience my experience of the criminal justice system is is twofold and that's me as a, an advocate um, and then the impact that I've seen on defendants so in terms of um, me as an advocate obviously as I said at the beginning I've never been mistaken as the defendant when I've been into court but I have been assumed to be a member of court staff. So um, someone thought I was a list caller once. I spoke to Judy about this. I know the same thing happened to her where she was assumed to, to, to be an usher. And although you're not being mistaken as the defendant, it's the assumption that you're not the lawyer that I think is, is, is part and parcel of the problem. And, you know, uh, it, it, it kind of goes back to what Chris Rock says, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's not, um, uh, overt racism but it's more oh you surely you're not part of the club surely you're not a lawyer or someone who, who's gone on and, and, and trained and I, I think it, it's, it's that subtlety that I've really had to get my head around because at, at first I might not have appreciated 
what was happening, but because it's been talked about so often and because there have been so many examples of um, either advocates, black advocates being mistaken as the, as, as the defendant, you know, it, it's really been at the forefront of my mind recently. Um, in terms of my experience and, and sort of cases that, that, that I've worked on where there's been racism within the criminal justice system, when I was thinking about it, I think broadly um, it falls into two categories and how this sort of subtle racism um, manifests itself. And firstly, um, in relation to charging decisions made by the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, and secondly, in relation to the treatment of um, suspects as they are then by the police. So I'll just give you a, a couple examples of, of cases that I really have felt have a, an underlying um, racial um, element. And both are youth cases, actually. Um, the first case was um, a, a, a schoolgirl who was um, 15 at the time of the alleged offence. She was charged with having in her possession a bladed article on school premises. And that, for those who don't know, is a sort of separate offence to just simply being in possession of a bladed article. It's the fact that she's on school premises as well. Um, now, the bladed article in question was a pair of scissors. Um, and they were non-school issued scissors. So they, um, they weren't the, the, the safety scissors that you get given it in class. But equally, it was the Crown's case and it was always accepted by them that the scissors were, were in the, the defendant's blazer pocket, in the pocket of a blazer where she kept her pens and her pencils and her ruler. And it wasn't the Crown's case that she'd used or, or threatened them. It was simply that she was seen in the dining hall with a pair of non-school issued scissors. And despite extensive written representations, that case proceeded to trial. Um, I'm very pleased to say that the, 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 the magistrates at Romford Youth Court were able to see exactly what, um, you know, what the reality of the case was. And, and you know, she, 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 she wasn't doing anything wrong and they, and, and, and they acquitted her. And, the second case, I, I just want to give you the facts of before I go on to tell you what I think about those two cases. Um, it's a case that I was actually dealing with today in Wilsdon Youth Court, and that was um, a, young, a young boy who um, had only just turned 14 at the time he committed the offence. It was a week after his um, 14th birthday. Um, his brother had very sadly been killed in a road traffic accident about um, six months before this offence and he was driving a, a moped and, and was knocked over um, and this young person um, you know understandably perhaps through the grieving process had made the silly and, and, and reckless decision perhaps to, 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 to take a moped um, and to drive it without having a license um, and without having insurance. And police officers saw him activated their blue lights and instead of him pulling over for about three seconds, he, he, he drove um, away from the police. He then um, mounted the pavement, dismounted off, off the bike, threw it on the floor and, and, and ran away. Um, he's been charged with a, a five offences, I think, dangerous driving, taking a vehicle without consent, do, do, just loads of, of, of things. And we're trying to sort that case out for him. But both of those young people, both of those children um, are black. And I, approaching the, the, these cases, ask myself, well, would the case have proceeded against them if they were white? Now, I, I don't know the answer to this, and um, it sort of links to what I'm gonna go on to talk about, about how the police perceive black people as, as being a threat. But I suppose, isn't, isn't the issue the fact that I even have to ask that question in the first place? The fact that I even have to stop and say, well, if it was a, if it was a, a, a you know a little skinny white kid that had jumped on a moped after the death of the death of his brother and was acting out through grief, you know, would he have been charged? Um, obviously, my my young person on on, on the moped in in this case, um, he he's very tall, he's he's quite broad. You know, you wouldn't look at him and think he was a, a fourteen year old child. Um, and you know, perhaps herein the problem lies because the police see them and perceive, you know, the police saw him and perceived him as being a threat. And actually, 
he's a, a child, a very young child who last year wasn't even a teenager. But, you know, here we are in a situation where his life choices are, are, are effectively going to be limited by charging decisions made by the Crown Prosecution Service. And, you know, we talk about Black Lives Mattering, and of course they do, but it's the life chances of those Black people that I'm also talking about. And I, I can't help but think that some of these charging decisions are limiting the life choices of some of our, our, our Black youth, our Black children. And actually no one's, no one's kicking up a fuss about that. Like I, I feel really angry about that. I feel really angry that, that a, a, a 14 year old boy who lost his brother and who was grieving, who's made, yes, a stupid and reckless decision, hasn't been considered for an out of court disposal. I, 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 I just think it's awful. Um, so in terms of charging decisions, those are sort of two stark examples where I've just had to stop and think, you know, if a, if a little, if, if a white kid was seen in school with a pair of scissors, would she be in, in the courts or would she have just had the scissors taken off her and be given a detention and told not to bring them in again? Um, and can I just say, in relation to that case with the scissors, it wasn't even specified in the school's own policy that you weren't allowed to bring scissors, non-school issued scissors onto school property. That wasn't even spelled out anywhere. So how we ended up having a trial on it, I'll never know. Um, my second um, point and an observation really in relation to the sorts of cases I've been working on um, sort of at the coalface in the magistrates court is the treatment of black people by the police. And I cannot tell you the number of cases I've had that involve either a charge for obstructing the police or assaulting the police that arise as a result of the stop and search of a black man. And it's not uncommon for me to read my case papers um, and without even looking um, in the MG5 for what the race of the individual is, knowing from the way in which the police write their witness statements that they've stopped and searched a, a black man and it's gone wrong and he's either lashed out or he's, you know, obstructed and, and not felt, you know, comfortable being searched and, and tried to, try, try, try to run away. And um, I think that's why I wanted to premise everything that I said at the beginning by reference to the fact that I've never experienced this and I can't for one minute imagine what it must be like as a black man to be constantly stopped by the police, to be constantly asked to empty my pockets and actually not to be treated with a, a high level of courtesy. And the, the, the body worn footage that we get disclosed in these sorts of cases is often really quite harrowing to watch. And there was a case that I did recently, again in Romford, where um, the defendant was in the car, police approached, very quickly things escalated to the point that the officers were dragging him out of the car and putting their hands around his throat and then trying to force him forcibly on, onto the ground. And again, I can't help but think that actually that behavior by the police is premised on this mistaken assumption that black men are to be feared, that they can't be spoken to in, in a humane way. They can't be asked, sir, please, could you get out of the car? You know, they have to be put in handcuffs because what do the officers always say in their witness statements? He, he posed an unknown risk. He posed an unknown risk by virtue of the fact that his skin was black and you thought that that was something to be feared. And, you know, it, it, it goes back to what, what's happened in America, doesn't it? About when police officers draw their guns on, on black men because, they're fearful that, 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 that the black man is, is going to assault them and, and, and that's how they justify it. Um, so, I mean, really, those, those examples are probably quite depressing for people to hear, but that's just the reality of, of, of the sorts of, of cases that are in the magistrate's court at the minute that I've been dealing with. Um, in terms of the second part of this seminar about what we can do about it, um, I don't, I don't know, I don't have many answers, but um, I suppose two things that you can practically do. Number one, I think as, as junior advocates, you have to be absolutely utterly fearless in your cross-examination of police officers. I think when they're on the stand, you really have to put to them what it is that you say they've done wrong, hold them 
hold them by hold them accountable by virtue of pace um I mean, try not to be too dramatic about it in your cross-examination because the magistrates, you know, they just don't like that. But I really think that you need to draw their attention to the guidance and, and make it very clear what they've done wrong. Um, and, and don't be scared to do that. And don't let them don't let them sort of weasel their way out of it because they absolutely will if given the opportunity. Um, and then secondly, um, I would encourage people who are getting these cases at a lower level um, to challenge CPS charging decisions if, if it doesn't sit well with you. So, you know, there might not be anything that you can put your finger on, as I said at the beginning. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to write written representations saying you've only charged, you know, my young person because she's black. And if there was a white school girl with scissors, you wouldn't have charged her. But I do think that formal written representations can be put together on the basis of it not being in the public interest. And you can often find arguments in, in favor of that. And actually the case that, that, that I dealt with today about my young person with those sort of driving matters, um, the judge has given us a, a, a short adjournment to make those written representations because I just don't believe that it, it, it would be in the public interest to limit his life choices by virtue of five convictions. I, I just don't think that's right. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining and hopefully, um, you know, we might be able to have a real sort of productive and constructive discussion about what we can do. Um, um, and, you know, having events like this obviously help and equally acknowledging the injustice um, and acknowledging that some of us do sit in positions of privilege, whether or not we're allies. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't think that I could, um, I don't think I could pr profess to have been discriminated against because of my race, um, notwithstanding my, my biology, as, as Dexter was, um, was talking about. But yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Danielle, thanks very much. I think you make a really important point, which is that um, racism is not often over in our criminal justice system. It is very often insidious and it's subtle. Um, and we can all think of those examples when you say to yourself, would this happen if this defendant were a white person? Um, I, I was sitting as a recorder and I had a young defendant in front of me. He was a young black lad. He had been given a suspended sentence for possession of cannabis with intent to supply, so low level streeting of cannabis. And um, he breached it. He'd, he'd not done his unpaid work. He may have also committed some other minor offence. It comes before me, the probation service say, revoke the order. And revoke the order essentially means activate the suspended sentence. So I say, tell me a bit about him. He's at university and he's at, working in a supermarket to pay his way through university. And I thought, well, I'm not going to send this person to prison. So I said, um, have can probation consider his circumstances and can he come back in a week's time before me with some kind of proposal I want this to be that those factors be taken into account I was completely astonished when a week later he came back before me and probation's count uh, the council for the probation service said our, our proposal is that the order ought to be revoked and I said so essentially you're saying that notwithstanding the fact that he's at university and has a job to support himself, that he should be put in prison. And obviously I did not put him in prison. I found some other way of dealing with him, but I thought, I found myself thinking, would that happen? If this was a, a young white lad, particularly a young white middle-class lad, a court would bend over backwards, as would the probation service, to, to avoid taking that first step, which that, that could have changed the course of his life. And we all see it like that there are myriad examples we can all think of them so um i think it is really important what you said danielle it's the, the the subtle it lies in the subtle and it doesn't matter at what level um dealing with things in the magistrates court criminalizing people so that you ruin their future life chances it, it all matters um right we've got very limited time left but i'm going to see if we can answer some of the questions um I'm going to deal with one from um, R. Williams says, is racism as a motive raised in cross-examination of those police officers? Well, for my own part, I think, I think and I'll see what the other panellists say, but I, you, can't, you can't levy that kind of accusation lightly. 
Um, it, it, and, and you risk the alienation of the bench, the tribunal, whether it be a magistrate's court or even a jury. You have to have some clear basis for calling that. And it, you, you don't do it lightly. I mean, there are ways of doing it if it's a jury. There are ways of putting that point across that the jury get the point. But you, you don't lightly say you were being racist unless there is clear evidence. Dexter, I, I said that um, there was a, a quite interesting question from Matthias yeah. Statistics, and the, I hope everyone can read the actual question. I'm just going to read the end of it, which is, would you call it racism or prejudice in the penitentiary system in the UK? And this is in relation to, um, in particular, Eastern European um, defendants. So I, I'm sure, Dexter, you've had a chance to look at the statistics. Yeah. There's another, I think um, Mateus has also sent a link later on. So um, any comments on that, Dexter? Yeah, well, I, I think, Jude, thanks. There are, th I think there are three questions. There's Matthias's question, there's uh, Hannah's question, and there's also in the chat uh, a really interesting question from Charles. But if I deal with Matthias first about the issue of Eastern Europeans and race and how that's constructed, if we apply the principle uh, systematically and rigorously, that race is a form of dehumanization. It's a tool for marking out certain population groups in an arbitrary way as being of less social value. If you look at the history of what happens to Eastern Europeans, look at the United States. What's interesting is in the United States, East European, Eastern Europeans, um, in, terms, in census terms, are considered white. At the beginning of the 20th century, they were not. They were not. They were a racialized, separate group. And so these uh, categories, they shift over time. And so Eastern Europeans, earliest tw early 20th century United States, not considered white. Nazi Germany in the 1930s, Eastern Europeans not considered equal citizens particularly Sla Slavic people in particular. And then dispiritingly, in Brexit Britain, Eastern Europeans racialized and not considered to be equal citizens and to be a racialized group. So yes, the answer to Matthias's question is absolutely, because it's all to do with how we construct a particular population group for other political ends. And so you can see that with Eastern Europeans. That's the first question. Second question is really interesting one from Charles, which um, let me just get it up. It's in, you people will find it, folks, uh, in the chat. And he says, surely racism is intricately linked to imperialism. And then he ends by saying any analysis that doesn't consider Britain as imperialist will not get to the heart of the matter. Well, Charles, I couldn't agree more. And it's really really troubling that what is happening is that uh, these discourses, these necessary conversations about the truth of British uh, imperial history and our colonial past are being stifled and snuffed out at schools. Therefore, and it's interesting, Kia mentioned one of the responses to that appalling case of Sean's being unconscious bias training. What's happening is that, and you might have followed it, that the government has said that unconscious bias training is not going to be continued for civil servants uh, because they say it's ineffective. Of course, the empirical evidence is it depends upon, and the research evidence is, it depends upon who is doing the training. It can be hugely effective, but not if it's done in a, in a perfunctory way. But the government also made another announcement saying that critical race theory, so trying to have a constructive and um, critical approach to history should be banned from schools. And who said that? Kemi Badenoch, who is the equalities minister. So the equalities minister herself is saying that we should, uh, in this way, censor and stifle proper investigation into the truth of our colonial past. Third question, uh, Hannah's question about the Equality Act. I think, Hannah, we've, we've got to make a sharp distinction between, on the one hand, the fact, and we should always contest the fact 
that race is a biological concept, because it isn't. It isn't. It must be. And one of the things that we can do and should do is to challenge it. But having said that, it is vitally important for there to be the collation of data about the disproportionate impacts on different population groups that are uh, to do with heritage, origins, migration, um, and culture, so ethnic groups, rather than, in inverted commas, racial groups. And a good example of that is one of the cases I mentioned right at the start, the Gareth Mike case. Gareth was the youngest child then to die in a British penal institution after three prison officers um, restrained him in an incredibly dangerous fashion, and he died. We wanted to try to find out, and he was uh, biracial, and we wanted to find out whether or not there was a disproportionate uh, use of restraint on uh, children of colour. And of course, the government did not want to disclose that data, and they never do. They'll disclose data that is going to uh, obviously put them in a good light or is going to advance a particular agenda of theirs. And we had to fight for it. And when we actually got disclosure on it, of it, surprise, surprise, what did it show? That there was a vastly disproportionate use of state coercive force on children whose skin happened not to be white. So, uh, Judy, those are the three... Uh, questions that I, I thought it might be useful answering. Uh, I've got three concluding comments, but maybe I could shelf that till the end, perhaps. We're running out of time, and I just wanted to answer some more of the um, the questions. Sonia asks, how can you deal with the racist record or magistrates, magistrates throwing the book at your client? How can you um, prevent your client's life being affected by their racism? How do you hold the judge to account? But it comes back to, again, the point that I, I made in, in relation to what Danielle said, it's very often insidious, it's very subtle. And it, you, I mean, obviously you have an appeal um, process from magistrates to Crown and Crown to Court of Appeal. Uh, it's very difficult. You often have that sense that, well, would this have happened if it was a white defendant? It's very difficult to, 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 um, to know what might lie behind it. So you have to look for the, the cues in what they're saying and I mean, I have known people to go along armed with elements or passages from the Lamy Review when they're dealing with people who are charged with low yeah. offences because that is an area where particularly Lamy found evidence of discriminatory sentencing. So I've known people to quote Lamy in that context. So, so that's a possibility. You, yeah. Well, that, that, yeah. that definitely happens, Jude. That definitely happens. And also when I've been sitting, people, have, advocates have done that to me. And I've welcomed it. The other point I would make, Daniel asked the right question, what can we do about it? One of the things we can do about it, and I'm bound to say, being a veteran of 32 years, or 33 years at Garden Court, shockingly enough, the, the, I think our approach to uh, sitting has completely changed. When I started, none of us did, none of us sat. What you can do is to encourage people who are representative of the entire community to sit and to get involved in the systems. One of the things that is less likely to happen if you have a person of colour who's sitting, it is on balance less likely that you're going to get that kind of outcome. It's not inevitable. I look at, look at the Equalities Minister, for example, but the more people who are representative of the wider community, who sit in positions of power, it will make a massive, massive difference. The first ever case I sat on as a recorder, um, where I had the pleasure of having um, Michael House, one of our founding members of Chambers in front of me, can you believe my first ever case, was a young black, black lad in South London who uh, was alleged to have um, used violence against the police. It was almost, a 1980s Brixton type of case. And when the jury acquitted him in about four minutes, his grandfather stood at the back of the court and turned to me and then uh, put his hands together and bowed. And I said, excuse me, sir, why are you doing that? And he said, because this is the third generation of my family who have come to this court and none of them has ever been treated 
with respect before like you have treated my son. And it's simple things like the officers were constantly calling the defendant by his surname. I said, no, you call him Mr. And just little things like that. We can make a difference, the appearance of it, but also the substance of it. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add to that in relation to Sonia's question is that actually when you're representing children and young people, the Sentencing Council guidelines um, in relation to sen sentencing children and young people, that's what it's called, um, paragraph 1.18 actually has explicit reference to the fact that um, black and ethnic minority children are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and when having regard to the welfare of the child, that's something... Um, their race, it, that's something that, that is to be taken into account. So I often put that in front of them because that's in the guidelines and that's what it's there for. Important step to take. And um, there's a question from, I think it's Jay, it says Jem, and then in the next comment it says JH. Um, Do you not think confronting racism in the justice system goes hand in glove with racism in the education system? Structurally, the education system, the way it treats African heritage black people feeds the, the criminal justice system. More black boys are disproportionately excluded. How do we interrupt that pipeline if we don't interrupt the education system? And I just want to say on that, that's a, a really important point. We all represent young defendants who've been excluded from school all too readily. They're excluded because of a, an unintended consequence of these academy schools is to get their funding. They want good exam results. They exclude kids who they perceive are unlikely to do so well in their exams at the drop of a hat. And once uh, kids are in a pupil referral unit, as we know, it's a recruiting ground for gangs. And so the path is set for criminalization and, and all that goes with it. And at Garden Court, actually what we've done is we, we're setting up a, a group of us. We have set up a group of us who want to deal with and represent um, parents in um, these exclusion hearings. Uh, it's a really important part of the process of trying to redress this, this terrible imbalance in our system. So it, that is a very important point that is made um, by Jem. Sharina asks, what, what if any legal challenges can be brought in respect of charging decisions in a case where written representations have been made? For example, can the decision be judicially reviewed? Um, um, yes, it yes it can. I did. We did it recently. In fact, the letter before action was almost identical to the written representations that had been sent in. And would you know? Lo and behold, um, the crown offer no evidence a couple of weeks later. So almost always worth sending a pre-action protocol letter, just outlining your case as per your letter of reps. Um, somebody whose surname is Agnieszka. I hope I'm pronouncing the surname correctly. Following on the question about Eastern Europeans and the Roma, how does poor knowledge of English affect the treatment of non-citizens within the UK justice system? Uh, I think there's a very short answer to that, Keir. Do you want to answer um, that, that one? Um, somebody who's got poor knowledge of English, um, in your view, is that going to affect the, their treatment within the justice system? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complete and utter um, nightmare. If you don't speak uh, the language, it has impacts at every single stage. Um, trying to represent someone properly um, in present conditions is very difficult. Uh, if you've got communication uh, problems on top of that, it's virtually impossible. Trying to present to a jury what your client is saying through an interpreter is incredibly problematic and very often what's being said doesn't get conveyed with all the professionalism of the interpreters that are employed just doesn't get properly conveyed uh, either to the judge or indeed uh, to the jury uh, and it's a real problem um, that requires greater resources um, in the criminal justice system and I, I, I it's on the long list of things that need to be done. Um, Tex, did you want to answer the last question from, the name isn't given, but it follows on from you answered the question on the Roma. Um, yeah. It's, um, What's the question? I can't, I'm not sure which one you're talking about, Jude. The panellists say that in the course of their practice, oh, yeah. evidence of racial bias in the criminal justice system towards Roma uh, and Gypsy people, I know that the Lamy Review drew attention to 
to the lack of data available on Roma and Gypsy communities within the criminal justice system. So have you ex seen or, or yeah. have? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. In fact, I did, I represented, um, I, was it one or two? Well, it, it was started off as two, but eventually one Roma person in a very serious trial where it was obvious to me that the way in which not only the uh, charging position uh, decision was approached, but also when we got to trial, the way in which um, a jury looked and conceived of that uh, particular person was completely racialized. But what I would say is that the, although the application of the process was on a different uh, individual, the mechanism is just the same. And therefore the solution is also just the same. What your, our task as advocates, our task as lawyers, is to try to humanize the particular individual and to try to strip away that surface element of, um, or that coating of suspicion and disdain and contempt and fear. And once you do that, and once um, you're able in court to do that, my experience, there was another question or another comment in the, I think in, in the chat sidebar about, you know, jury, juries as well can be racist. Juries are made up of individuals um, who, living in a society that's highly racialized. It is not surprising that uh, juries and jurors are going to have racialized views. The way, to, the way to deal with it is not, is not to uh, tell people that they are racist, but to discuss it honestly, to, to speak. And what I always do is speak as openly as I can about that. As I think Daniel said, elephant in the room. If there's a herd of elephants in the room about these things. And, it, and part of the moral courage we've got to have is to have the conviction to say, look, we're not saying you're bad people, but we are saying that this process is bad. There is a part of society that is creating these outcomes again and again, that is detrimental and unjust, but we can together do something about it. And I've seen in case after case after case, uh, juries actually coming to the right decision on things like that. And I'm a massive fan of them, I'm bound to say. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing is that Lamy in his review, in fact, the only two areas where he didn't find evidence of um, discrimination or disparate treatment was <clears throat> juries, even all white juries, in fact. Yeah. And also with, in charging decisions made by the CPS. But it was interesting to note that the ethnic minority makeup of the CPS was greater than in the general population, which might mean that, that therefore charging decisions were being were reflected in in the way that that was being dealt with yeah and on that same topic there's a question i mean this we could talk we could actually do two hours on this top question alone which is how do you feel about the bame term being used i think we'd all say we hate it i especially hate when it is it is pronounced just bame not even bame just bame but I think the slightly difficult thing is even, for example, in the Lamy review, all of the data collection is dealt with in terms of that yeah. front term. So that it's, it's very difficult trying to get away from it, but I think there is a movement away from it now. So I hope uh, no one will mind if I just say we, we all hate it and we're, we're all moving, trying to move away from it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, in the United States, uh, different, when I was at Harvard, completely different terminology was used i pr i prefer to refer i prefer to refer to people as people of color other people won't like that but there isn't a correct solution to that but we do need to have some kind of label that's intelligible because if we don't what's going to happen is that there won't be the data collection and without data collection the system will perpetuate itself data is absolutely critical well, that, that's, that's the issue, isn't it? So, um, Kimberly, I think your question has been answered effectively by um, Dexter, um, which is the dealing with people in the family courts and getting the right balance of judges and professionals.
uh, courts very much still feel like a white middle upper class world. And, and you're right, but I do think the, the judiciary is changing. And the fact, I think that three people from Garden Court, all of us people of color on this panel are, are all recorders sitting part-time as, as Crown Court judges is, is an important reflection of that. Yeah, can I just say about the family court, it's an interesting fact that uh, Kimberly, Kimberly actually mentioned that. Because I, since uh, the first lockdown, I've done a lot of sitting uh, in the family court um, and uh, in the family division of the High Court. And I've got to say that a, a, a significant proportion, I, I can't quantify it, but a significant proportion of the professionals in the family uh, division and family court are people of colour, much more so than I'm accustomed to actually in criminal. I'd be very interested to know if anyone knows any statistics, but if you look at um, social workers, team managers, uh, indep even independent social workers, children's guardians, advocates, um, they are many, many people of, of colour at every level, which, which I thought was quite interesting. So I hadn't, I hadn't anticipated that. Uh, yeah, there's, there's finally, there's a, a question from Ruth. It's, it's more a rhetorical question and I, I, I read it, but I, I think we, it, it's the, the answer to the question is in the question itself. Do you think that Shamima Begum would not have been stripped of her British nationality if she'd been white and would she have been barred from appearing in person in the UK court to defend herself on this issue if she'd not been black? This issue also points to the racist way terrorism is dealt with and immigration issues. So I think your answer, the question is, given the answer, it's a rhetorical question, I think, from the, from the terms of it. Um, can I just say that somebody in the chat has asked Danielle to circulate um, some documents. And in fact, what will happen after this webinar is that if you're a registered uh, participant, <coughs> An email inviting you to it then the, the the papers and so on any materials that are, are being used will be circulated afterwards by amy from our um, marketing department um, and can, then can i just pick up on a, a a question that sonia's um posed in in the middle of this or, or, or in fact quite recently and it's it's presented as a comment uh, and an, an observation that we've done these talks or webinars with American lawyers. And she makes the point that the American approach is a bit more aggressive or confrontational in terms of um, arguing about racism in court and wonders if British advocacy could take a note from their book and bring a more muscular argument against prosecution and judicial indications of racism. Are we being too polite? Uh, and yes, we are. I, I think we're all hesitant, and I include myself in this. Far too hesitant about using the R word in court, whether that's in relation to witnesses or in relation to judges um, and presenting what we see every single day, uh, week in, week out, month in, month out in terms of the courtrooms before the jury or before the judge. We tend to draw back from it. And I'll tell you why, it's bloody hard. It's really difficult to talk about racism, even, even between us, let alone in a public courtroom. I, I, I find it difficult. And I think we do need to learn from the American example where they are less hesitant about it. And we do need to uh, talk about it, not always subtly. You know, we need to call it what it is. And if uh, a search is racist, let's call it racist. I appreciate there are techniques and there are tactics and there is discussions with your client, but we need to be a lot more upfront because otherwise I can see us having this conversation if we're all still around, I don't know if we will be, <laughs> in 30 years time. The same conversation. And I think we're all tired of it. All of us are tired of it. We shouldn't be talking about this now. It should be something else. Yeah, but here, here, I, having spent quite a lot of time, as you know, in the United States, um, I, I'm, I, I'm not a huge fan of how they approach it. I've got to say, and I'm not, I'm not a huge fan 
of how they conceive it either. I, I personally, I don't, I don't perceive that colleagues of mine are timid about this, but I do think that we've got to reverse engineer it. What we want to do, it's very easy, actually, I think, to go into court and to launch a number of accusations that don't have a sufficient foundation. And you can grandstand like that, but are, the question you've got to ask is, are you going to get the right and the best optimal result for your late client if you do that? I've never had, personally, I've never had a problem about calling out racism in court, and I've done it in numerous, numerous cases. But I do think that the American approach, which tends to be using it as a strategy, um, and they are taught uh, ways in which you can play the race card. I hate that idea. It, it shouldn't be a card to be played. What it should be is critically and evidentially and empirically evaluating the truth of what is happening. And if the truth is because of racialized thinking, racialized practices, racialized policies and racialized outcomes, you call it. And I think we can do that. I, and I think we should. I think we should. Um, I, I see the time and I know Dexter, you wanted to make some um, very brief concluding. Uh... Just two. I've, I've, I've got rid of one because we're out of time. I want... <laughs> so I just want to make two final points. If, I, if we can, Judy, just, very, just a couple of minutes for each one. The first one is this, and it's going back to what Danielle says about what can we actually do. I started off introducing a number of death in custody cases that, and, and I, I had done, one and the ones I mentioned, I've done most of those. Other members of chambers, I think have done almost all the others. One of the very best things you can do if you are interested in fighting against that is to join the charity inquest and to support them. Because I've done a lot, load of those cases other members of Garden Court have done the others. Inquest, I think Deb and Anita are probably here. They've done every single one of them, every single one of them. And those grieving families would not have got anywhere near the vindication of their Article 2 rights, even in the days before it was Article 2, uh, if it wasn't for Inquest. Please go to their website, find out you can support what they do. And I want to pay tribute to the work that they do, that Deb Coles and Anita Sharma do and have done uh, for years and years. Uh, frankly, and they'll be embarrassed that I say it, but they are heroes, frankly. The second point I want to make is about the comment about power. If we just take a step back and think about it, the truth is this, and one, one of the one of the real areas of contestation on the left, on the left, liberal left, that is so despised uh, by those people who are painting out the BLM uh, letters, who, who people who are so despised by this government, activists, lawyers. But what I'm going to assume that mo a lot of us on this webinar tonight uh, are proud to be so categorised. I certainly am as an activist lawyer. But one of the issues that we've got to contend with is this, we've got to resolve amongst ourselves, this issue. There is a school of thought which says when we're dealing with racism, that uh, people of color, well, I'm not going to engage and talk about it. I'm not gonna to try to uh, have conversations with white people or dominant power about it. They've got to sort it out themselves. I went to garden court, uh, in the 1980s because um, I wanted to do anti-apartheid work. And when I went to Garden Court in my first year, I spent a lot of the time, often pro bono, representing anti-apartheid activists who were protesting 24 seven outside South Africa House in Trafalgar Square. And very often they'd get arrested and beaten up by the police and charged with public order offenses. If you asked, um, Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King about what we should do. I think each of them would say, we have to engage. We have to have conversations. We've got to challenge people 
and try to change the dialogue. Because the truth is power will, the possessors of power will never just give it up. The way in which it changes, and it is a dynamic thing, the ebbs and flows, is about the nature of the contest. And the contest is something that is happening every day. It happens in court, it happens outside court. And I'm absolutely convinced that every single one of us who is here today on this webinar together can make a material difference to that if we want to. And so I think the moral question for us as moral sentient human beings is, well, given what we know about racism within the criminal justice system, am I willing to do something about it? Am I willing to actually find out more, make sure I understand what it's about? And I can't pretend personally that I do. I've been trying to research this for the last 10 years systematically, and I've been operating in the system uh, as a barrister for 30, and I still don't know much about it. I'm trying. But our questions, our question is, if we feel strongly about this, if we think this is one of the greatest injustices in our society, which I personally believe it is, what am I prepared to do about it? Thank you very much, Dexter. Um, I'm just going to mention one other thing, which is Cressida has put a link in the chat and the questions to a GoFundMe page for giving young black adults vital second chances. So um, do click on that link and have a look at that. Um, just leaves it for me to tell you that our next webinar um, will in fact be on the 28th of April at five o'clock. Criminalising Youth will be the topic and that's in collaboration with Just for Kids Law and Susan Wright from Garden Court will be chairing that. Uh, we did have a webinar scheduled for the 17th of March that has moved due to court commitments that's now scheduled to take place on the 18th of May and uh, the, the seminar that's Defending Black Lives Matter protests and the final one will be I Smell Cannabis and that's going to be on Thursday the 27th of May but if you uh, a subscriber to our webinar series and you'll get the details of that circulated by email so thank you to all of the panelists um, for very interesting thought-provoking talks and thank you to the participants for attending.